Did my SCU logo just come up? Sorry. Oh, we're live. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So here we go. Well, welcome, guys. We're glad to have you join us here on the Photo Focus Hangout. And we've also got Skip Cohn from Skip Cohn University. This is the Mind Grown Business Hangout, and we're talking about business topics that affect creative professionals, but in particular, photographers. And I'm going to toss over to Skip, who's going to give you a good intro as to what this week's, this month's topic is all about. Skip, go ahead. All right. Well, let's start by introducing my good buddy. This is a fun one to do today because Tony Corbell and I have been hanging out together for, I don't know, 20, 25 years, give or take. Uh, probably 80% of the stories I have of doing something stupid in my career, uh, Tony was there to witness it. Um, he is a, he's an author, he's an educator, he's a writer, he's an artist, he's a photographer. Um, he's probably best known over the last probably 10 years for the way he teaches lighting. And he's just a really good friend and buddy to a whole mess of people in the photo industry. And that's, that's Tony. And we're going to talk about quality today because about, and Tony, you can correct me as soon as I let you actually have the mic, it's probably about five to seven years ago that Tony was teaching a workshop at PPA and in front of, I don't know, 500, 1,000 people, he made everybody raise their right hand and pledge <laughs> to stop compromising the quality of their images. So we're going to talk about, about quality because it's an incredible way to make your work different and make yourself stand out today. It's probably the best marketing tool you could have. So on that note, um, welcome, Mr. Corbell. Hello, Mr. Cohen. Thank you, guys. This is, uh, this is fun for me. This is a big treat. I, uh, I appreciate it. You, uh, you guys have clearly built a big following here, and, and if there's anything I can say that might help a little bit, great. I'm all for it. Uh, you know, it's funny, you were talking about that program I did, and that was at PP of A in Tampa. And, and I distinctly remember, just before walking into my presentation, I walked through the print exhibit. And we just made the good, solid transition into digital, all of us had. And everybody was getting kind of lazy, and everybody was relying on post-production. And I started off the program, and I said, man, I just came from the print exhibit. And i got to tell you guys, it was awful. <laughs> and I said, your work was awful. And I said, and guess what? So is mine. And we are all relying way too much on post-production for our quality. And we got to stop it. We have lost sight of chasing after a great image. And we're deciding, well, let's make one later. And it doesn't work that way. You can't, you know, you can't make a bad image good with post-production. You can make a great image better, but you can't make a bad one good. And so I just made them all, <laughs> I made everybody raise their right hand and, and I state your name, promised not to suck anymore. <laughs> it didn't go very well, I don't think. I think I, think I lost a few, uh, a few attendees that day. Well, I remember seeing you about 10 minutes later and I remember your comment. I may not be asked to speak again. Uh, Ever again. At PPA. Yeah. Ever well, again. That, didn't, that obviously didn't happen. No, but, I, I got asked back, but... But you have been one of the big ambassadors to get everybody to stop compromising and get a clean image right out of the can. Or as you and I have repeatedly both used the expression, you can't buff a turd. And yeah. there it is. It's, it's back again in a mind your own business uh, Google you Plus can, app. I, you can make it very shiny. But it still right. smells kind of bad. <laughs> well, let's start by breaking that down for folks because you know we have people of different experience levels here. And, and also, for those of you who are participating in this Hangout Live, there is a question and answer pod. So we welcome you to submit questions there. And we'll do our best to answer as many of your questions during this Hangout. So if you're watching this on Google+, you'll see the Q&A pod. You can also access that on YouTube by clicking the Q&A button. And we'd welcome any questions that you have uh, for our guests today. But let's start with a good working definition of quality. Obviously, there's lots of different types of quality, but we're talking about at the heart of the image, making sure that we believe in the image. You know, you guys have both sort of mentioned, and, and I'm a huge fan of post-production. You know, that's where I make a lot of my money is doing post. But at the same time, you want to start with something and make it better, not start with something that you kind of felt okay about and try to salvage it. You know, rarely, sometimes I'm doing historical restoration and I may have to take something that is a technically inferior image and try to bring it up to spec, but 
where does this happen for you, Tony? Where do you where do you think quality starts? Is it during the pre-production stage, the visualization stage, or where do you know that it first has to start being a focus? I think it's I think it's all all the steps along the way, and 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 I hope that we'll get to uh, to follow up with more than just the image quality because there's another whole level of quality we got to talk about. But in the image quality, I do think that there is uh, there's light quality, there is <clears throat> impact quality. There's expression quality. There is, uh, you know, the right moment quality. I mean, there's a lot of little elements along the way that all have to align. Uh, but first and foremost, if your image lacks impact, you're in deep trouble before you even get started. Uh, but as, as we all know, some of the biggest issues that I see today are exposure issues and really just poor lighting choices. Uh, and it's people that just, they're, they're new, they don't, they don't know, and they can't get all of their learning, uh, they can't get everything online. They do have to attend live events and sit down with other photographers. Attend events locally, go to workshops, go to seminars, you've got to, you've got to, and, and nothing, nothing beats practice, practice, practice. I mean, uh, I, I can't tell you, you know, nobody gets it in a year or two. I think there's a handful of people that think they got it in a year or two. But I think we all, you know, I've been doing this 30, this is my 34th year, and 35th year, actually. And I think I've got about, I don't know, 70 or 80% of it. I don't have it all. Nobody has it all. We, we, you get most of it, though, the first three or four years, and then you spend the rest of your career chasing the rest of it. It's but that, it's that you, first 85% or first 90% that you can get to pretty quickly, and then that what differentiates it from everything else, I right? think you can. We can, uh, we can all understand shutter speeds, apertures, and, and ISOs. We get that. And we understand the mechanics of our camera, and, and uh, we get all that. Camera technique, how to hold our camera. Uh, the proper pose, the proper 3 to 1 ratio, whatever the ideas may be. But then to take it to another level, you chase that forever, you know? And uh, oh, every once in a while you get one, and it just makes you feel great when you do. Uh, I, last a week ago Thursday, I chased an elk a mile and a half in the rain, uh, and I and and he wouldn't stop. And I was just like, is this guy ever going to stop and get a drink of water? He was in a river, and he finally stopped. And when he finally stopped, put his head down and got a drink of water, and he raised his head and turned and looked at me in a three-quarter view. I had one frame left, and I got it. And and it just all came together. And it wasn't because I was lucky. I was kind of lucky, but but I had everything ready. I was totally prepared for it. You know, I knew the shot was going to happen. So, so anyway. skip, so skip to that end. You know, obviously we're talking about being ready for the shot. Uh, you know, Tony just told a great story about thinking through what was the shot you wanted to get. Skip, do you encourage photographers to sort of have in their brain what it is? Like, I encounter a lot of creative folks who seem to think that creativity happens spontaneously or at the spur of the moment and for me I have creative thoughts oftentimes well before the shoot or after the shoot it's hard to like just turn on creativity and if I've thought through things ahead of time sometimes I come up with better approaches not that you don't react to what's happening or take input during the shoot but how much could you do ahead of time Skip? Well I think a huge part of this relates back to your skill set Rich and understanding um, it's not. It's more than technique. It's understanding your gear. It's so that everything flows so smoothly that you are thinking more about the creativity of the shot as opposed to, um, okay, what I, you know, I don't know if I've got my camera set right. I don't know if I got the right focal length for the lens. And it is about the the skill set. Tony and I spent a lot of years together at, at Hasselblad where. We used to have retailers that were upset because they didn't feel that we said the name Hasselblad enough in the program. Well, Tony would come in and just talk about and teach lighting, posing, technique, depth of field. He'd talk about things that you just wanted to have as second nature so that if you understood all of that, when you went to get the shot, as Tony said, the elk turned his head. He was prepared. Um, Steve McCurry didn't have days to practice to get that shot of Afghan girl and yet it became the most recognized contemporary portrait in the world because he understood what he was doing and I think the more people can practice the more they get to know their gear the more they experiment um, it's it's years ago uh, I think it was Ernie Brooks wasn't it who said always save the last frame now yeah Ernie, he, Ernie he was arguing yeah yeah, save that one frame on a roll of film, 
And Ernie was trying to tell me why all my underwater images sucked. Well, they sucked because I didn't know what I was doing. Ernie would go down to the bottom of the ocean with an A12 magazine, have 12 shots, and come up with 11 winners and still save that one last shot to get that baby sea lion that would follow him around on, on every dive in that one location he used to go to. So yeah, it is it about fun. Yeah, it is about being comfortable. You gotta be you gotta be comfortable with your gear and your skill set. And Tony's comment about practice and experimenting and not shooting the same way all the time. It used to drive both of us nuts when we visited a photographer and they'd have masking tape or duct tape on the floor where they were going to put their tripod every day, where their lights went every day, where the posing uh, table and stool went. And you've got to be able to experiment, especially today. That's what's going to separate you from a lot of your competitors is really understanding what you're doing so that you are free. Back to your creative question, Rich. It's, it's understanding your gear and, and what you're going to get so well that you're not even thinking about it, and that opens up the creativity pipeline. So I, do think, I do think there's something to be said, though, for that predictability of having the tape on the floor and the lights and where everything goes. If you're doing production, high-volume work, schools, that sort of thing, dances, yep. that, that has an absolute place in our world. But it doesn't have a place for the regular day-in, day-out portraiture work where you're, trying to, where you're trying to create something special for a client. Nothing's going to be special if it, you know, I remember Dean, the great Dean Collins one time in my studio at the end of the day uh, in Texas, and we were, we were walking out for dinner, and he said, you going to leave your lights set up? I said, sure, why? He said, hey, it's none of my business. I said, what? And he said, well, he said, if you leave your lights set up like they are right now, he said, tomorrow morning's first session is going to look exactly like today's last session. <laughs> and he was exactly right. And so what that taught me was at the end of the day, every day, I would push my lights off the floor and move them against the wall, in hopes of setting them up a little bit differently the next day, you know? Now, to this end, as we're experimenting, obviously we have a challenge balancing our own personal growth and the quality of the images with the client's desires. As a photographer, you might come become known for a certain style or a certain approach or certain trends are very hot with images and compositions. Uh, you know, like right now, some of the trends going on in some of the wedding portraits where, you know, they're taking brides and they're posing them like models, which is a strange thing to me. Um, how do you balance your own personal style and your own desire to make the images different with client demands or you know meet in the middle. Tony, how do you balance out what you want to accomplish well, I, with what you need I, for the client? I can tell you the best response I've ever heard on this topic uh, came from John Paul Caponegro. When when John Paul said find find your own voice in whatever it is that you're doing photographically and let the clients come to you for that look and for that work and you will you will have a wonderful career if you do. If you don't if you start trying to be all things to all people and move and bend to what every different client asks for, you're going to burn out in your career and you're going to hate your work after a few years. So find your voice and let the clients come to you for that work. And I think there's really something pretty important to be said for that. There's a lot, there's a lot too, that ties in with believing in yourself. I just did a blog post uh, last week one day about... And I mentioned Matthew Jordan Smith, who told a story in a podcast where every time he would, every, with every image, he would show it to people when he was first starting and ask people, so what do you think? And he'd listen, and he was, he was trying to suck up all this critique and advice, and finally realized one day that he had to find, it's, it's, it's JP's comment again about find your own voice. Uh, it has to do with confidence, it has to do with believing in yourself. But another part of this, Rich, too, which there aren't enough photographers. When you're just starting out, you have to get to know your clients. And maybe that's another piece of, of quality. The excitement for wedding photographers, for example, the excitement to me of an engagement session has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with the engagement session. It has to do with the photographer and the subjects getting to know each other and get comfortable with each other so you get those natural poses, those great smiles. And then when you show up on the day of the wedding, um, you're already a friend of the family. You're already a, a familiar friend. I mean, a wedding is one of those situations where uh, what's the line about, about logic is not king um, on the day of a wedding? 
logic doesn't reign as king. That was it. And here the photographer comes in as a good friend of the bride and groom. Well, that comes out of relationship building. And I think in every shoot, um, we're, all of us know uh, commercial photographers, portrait, editorial, Gregory Heisler. Um, these are all people that also take the time. If they've only got five minutes to do the shot, then they're going to spend four of it getting their subject comfortable. And that last one minute will be where their creative spirit comes in and how they're going to do the shot. Well, Arthur, the great Arthur Rainville said, you know, uh, a photo is of someone, a portrait is about someone. And you can't do something about someone if you don't know them and talk to them. You know, All right, well, taking this up to the talent that people face, you know, everybody wants their images to be better. They want to stand out. And for a lot of our folks that are listening and read both of our websites, Skip, it's kind of elusive. You know, I, I have people ask me all the time, like, well, why do you put the camera settings below your photos? And I'm like, I'm like, why do you want it? Well, it's it's a recipe. I'm like, no, it's not, because if the light was, unless you were in that exact spot with that condition, and I and I read books, you know, and we talk about going to educational events. I see studying other people's successes, whether that be looking at how they put a shot together or how they interact. One of our writers on the website, Robert Vanilli, is doing a whole series on how I got the shot, and he walks people through from the pre-production to the delivery all the things that went through his head in the thought process. To me, that is one of the easiest ways to learn. So whether you have a real mentor or a virtual mentor, you sort of evaluate how that photographer makes critical decisions. And that's far more important than what settings did they use or what lens or body did they use. Tony, you've provided mentorship to a lot of folks through the years. What are some common points where you see people getting really stuck or getting too much into their head and losing perspective on a quality image? I think a lot of people are trying to uh, trying really, really hard to emulate another photographer, or you know, they will emulate the style of a photographer that they just watched in a seminar. Instead of taking that and adapting it to their own style, they will try to duplicate and and replicate what was done. You know, you know, uh, right after Ann Gettys hit big 20 years ago, 20, 25 years ago, with this this wonderful, wonderful whimsical portraits of kids. Uh, in unique positions and, you know, in unique props. Uh, the rest of the world tried to do it, and they failed miserably at it because Anne took it, Anne, Anne took it upon herself that those were commercial shoots. They were propped properly. They had staging. They were shot large format or medium format. They had a big crew. It was a commercial shoot for specific use instead of, sticking a baby in a fruit basket, uh, which is what a lot of people would then do. And they couldn't understand why their work didn't look like ants. Their work didn't look like ants because they were doing it by themselves, grabbing the baby and sticking it in the basket. And instead of an all-day shoot, they were trying to do it in 20 minutes, and it doesn't work that way. you know. So I think that, um, sadly, uh, thankfully, I think a lot of that has now gone away. I, I sure hope it has. It's kind of like the, the creative world of a white wicker basket. I, I, I can't do white wicker baskets. I just don't get it. Uh, you know, uh, but, I, but I do know that, that there are people, my girlfriend's a perfect example, she thinks everything through. She's got an idea in her head for a shot and she'll think about it for three or four months. And, and, and she had an idea to, to do a portrait on Billy Joel's song, Piano Man. And she just kept on it and on it and on it. And after three months, she finally got the right players together in a place with a piano, with a bottle of beer, with a cigarette, with a photograph on the book. She put this whole scene together, and it was a wonderful story. And she thinks that way, and a lot of people do. I think there's a lot of storytelling pictures. Richard Sturdivant and his massive talents of building and designing an image from a, a photograph that he takes on location of a football player. And by the time he finishes with this thing, there's 84 layers on it, and, and it is in the most... A, a most amazing uh, story of a photograph that you've ever seen. And those are wonderful things that people can think through if they know how to get there and do it with high-end high end quality. It's not for everybody, though. As, as the PJ world, some photographers would never survive in a photojournalist photo world. But the photojournalists that survive are amazingly talented at what they do. So, it, it, you know, it does go back to the word, the word of quality. 
you know. So to this end, as we're trying to measure this, because this is a, a very nebulous concept for a lot, I, I think, Skip and Tony, one of the things that would be helpful is if you could provide perhaps your working definition of a quality image. And, I, and I'll throw out a few points for me. Uh, one of the things that I always look for is not technical perfection with an image. Uh, and it's probably because I came from a concert photography and a journalism background. And for me, it was all about, did the image capture the story? Did it capture the moment? Did I freeze time? Uh, the history minor in me wants an image that is going to spark a conversation or trigger a memory or be memorable. And that's less about, well, how much grain is in the image or was it perfect? Uh, obviously, there's other people that are very technical photographers or commercial photography takes a much different approach. Uh, you know, you're shooting product shots. So obviously, it's going to vary for each one. But I, I think for me, the root goal is when I judge a photograph, I want to understand who was the target audience for that photograph and what was the application. For me, judging an editorial, the quality of an editorial photo is very different. I want to know is it going to keep somebody on the page? Are they going to not just scroll right past it, but does it pull them in and make them stop for a moment to absorb the details? And for me, a quality photo guides the viewer's eye that there has to be some sort of path. And this could be influenced through post-production where you've used vignetting and dodging and burning, but you are creating a path to the story. Now, that's just a few things that I always look for when people are asking me to evaluate their images. I want to know intent, and then I want to just sort of judge, did you guide the viewer through the image? Is there a story here, and do you provide a path to that story? But, Tony, Skip, either I, of you want to take a stab and add some things? Yeah, I think, I think, let me just jump in for a second. I think what you said there makes a lot of sense. If you go back to the NPPA, the National Press Photographer Association, and you look at the categories of awards that they give out, They've got storytelling, they've got documentary reportage, they've got spot news. They've got a lot of different categories that they refer to and talk about. Uh, you know, Collins, Dean Collins used to always say, there are two different kind of types of photographers in the world. One who records what is there and taking place. One that doesn't record what's taking place, rather creates what is not there. You know, you walk in, I walk into the studio where there's nothing on, there's nothing on. I have to put the background up, I turn up the lights, put them on light stands, and i got to make magic happen, as opposed to walking into a press conference and recording, you know, Evander Holyfield getting out of control and reaching over and smacking the other guy's manager. You can't miss those moments. So it all depends on what is the overall use. So I always tell my students, no matter what you do in this world in photography, you've got to think with the end in mind. And as long as you can think to the end, then how you get there is up to you, but you got to think with the end in mind, and you cannot miss the end. So it all depends on where your direction is and what you're trying to what you're trying to say with the work. Who's the client or the viewer? You know. Skip, I spent you? yeah, I spent three weeks um, about five years ago with Gregory Heisler doing a live print critique of close to two hundred student portfolios um, at Hallmark Institute up in Massachusetts. It was an incredible experience, and we both had two different views of the way we were looking at the quality of the portfolio and the images. From his perspective, it was a combination of um, composition, degree of difficulty, how it was lit. He was looking for a lot of things in technique as a photographer and an educator. From my perspective, having a background in marketing and going back to Hasselblad and Polaroid and, all, and Rangefinder, you know, I was looking at images more for what, what Tony used to call the wow factor. I remember years ago, Tony getting into a fight with, with the late, great Monty Zucker um, over a print in, in competition at WPPI, and Monty was upset because the photographer violated the rule of thirds, the exposure was strange, and I remember Tony holding this print up and said, wait a minute, does it make you go wow? Do you, you want stop and look at it? Yeah, um, and it was it was an incredible it was an it it really wasn't an argument at all because I think in the end you won hands down and Monty had to agree that you know what it's time to look at a different way that that I judge images. So it's to me it's the wow factor, and then there's one more in terms of quality, and it's it's the old line from our buddy Dean Collins: "Beauty is in the eyes of the checkbook holder." There's so, a client. 
Yeah, a lot of times it comes down to the client, but to get to that point, an image to me, Rich, it's it's everything you said, it's everything Tony said, but I'm still basic. I want to I want to be able to look at an image and realize that everybody looks at it is going to do one of those wow and you know suck all the wind out of the in, out of the universe. You know, one, one, of my old, one of my old friends from the 80s made the comment one time he said, "I know if I if I've got a good image, if I can hang it in my wall, on my wall in my bedroom and leave it there for three months and not get sick of it. <laughs> if you can look at it for three months and not get sick of it, you might have something. But you know, you gotta you gotta keep in mind that there's there's three people involved in every photograph you ever take. And that is number one, the one person has to think of the shot. Number two is one person has to take the picture. And number three, one person's gonna view the picture. So if you're a, a commercial photographer, you know, an art director might have thought of the shot and maybe you took the shot and a business guy at 35,000 feet on, you know, United 75 from JFK to LAX is viewing it in a magazine. Or if you're a, a, a fine art photographer, you probably thought of the shot and took the shot and hopefully it's in a gallery. And if you're an amateur... Hopefully you're not the only one viewing the shot. <laughs> that's right, that's right. But if you're an amateur, you might have... You might have thought of it. You might have taken the shot, and it might be hanging in your home. So you have to kind of figure out where you are in the in the food chain, you know, as to as to are you trying to please yourself, or the client, or the art director, you know, the, or the viewer at the end. I mean, it all depends on the starting with the end in mind, you know. You know, guys, one of the things that I constantly tell new photographers when they're building their galleries for their website is before you put any image in the gallery, ask yourself if this was the only image. I was allowed to show would I get hired if the answer is yes then it's got the quality and the representation of your skill set if the answer is nah not really then it doesn't belong in your gallery that's a great point well to that end one of the things that I'm constantly faced with is pruning down my work because it's always so easy to have too many work samples and a custom gallery for this and samples of this and here's some of these shots and not that I don't have those available to show people but I've tried to prune things down, and, and a recent exercise that I did was I put together an update to my Moo cards, the little mini cards where you can have different pictures on the back of each one, and it forced me to pick a hundred of my pictures that had all be cropped to the exact same dimension and viewed at a small size. And for me, to find images that work in something that tiny, I'll, I'll find one here in a second and hold it up, but to find something that works... I'll back of them right over there. <laughs> yeah, it, it was very helpful because it may really pull things in and then when I'm meeting other photographers or clients and I put like four or five out on the table it's almost a litmus test to see what do they react to and for me I'm an experimental you know my photography as a photo educator I have to work in lots of different genres I have ones that I love for me I'm a, I always tell I'm an anti-social photographer give me time lapse give me panorama give me landscape where I can be out in beautiful nature and not have to talk to anybody and I make great images give me people I make terrible portraits with rare exception unless it's somebody that I already have a connection with I don't like to make new connections uh, but it's very interesting forcing myself to pare it down to 100 images and then put those out so this is the third time I did it and I found that about I went through and I kept about half of the ones that I had done last time and put in 50 new ones and every time I do this I, I order small enough runs it's a little bit more expensive but it forces me to evaluate and I'm trying to get to my top 100 images that if I had to narrow it down that far I think a harder test would be to do my own top 10 skip through the years or Tony do you have any practical advice on this challenge of how do we get to our best work how do we kill your babies you know where you're not like well you know this image was so hard to get or I hiked up this mountain and got up at 2 a.m. yeah but the image isn't that good the story's great but the image isn't I think the first step is that you've got to know who your target audience is and that's one of the things that that is probably rich for you is a little is a little tougher because as a as an artist, as a photographer, as a filmmaker, um, you're you're pitching a client base, and it's a variety of clients looking for a variety of ways to tell their story. But I think what a yeah. lot of photographers forget about. I mean, I'll go onto a, a somebody's website, and let's say their target is children and family, 
but they've got their landscape shots, their headshot is is more of a landscape shot. In fact, they haven't taken the time to even do a decent headshot a lot of the times. So it's it starts I think with you've got to know your audience and then as you as you pare down, you want images that show diversity in your skill set. You want to show those things that you not only do best, but things that you are really proficient at. I I was just talking to Michelle Salentano today, and we were going through her her galleries, and it hit her that she really ought to have some more black and whites in there because black and white images are so strong. And she's redoing her website, and it's sometimes you need to bring in another pair of eyes. We're all too close to our own work, to our own site, to our own business, and you need well, a third party to come in. You know, Jay Mazel said uh, in a video interview he did for Santa Fe Workshops, he he said. If you're not your own worst critic, you are your own worst enemy, and uh, which I think is a great line. And I think that all of us have too many favorite babies on our site that need to come off. And I think that you know I feel bad for photographers that have you know all the categories. We are the you know specializing in families, children, babies, passports, weddings, commercial, editorial, aerial. No, you're not. <laughs> you, right. you cannot specialize in seven categories. You can be okay in seven categories. But there's one that you specialize in. But I'll go to people's websites and I'll see under their baby category, they might have 20 or 30 or 40 pictures of a baby. Give us five and you're, and you're fine, <laughs> you know? I, I subscribe to the belief of have more depth. So when they want to see more, you can show more. But it's like, you know, so I, I you mentioned the moot cards, you know, so for those who haven't seen them, you know, it's like some street photography. And again, another street photography image, uh, just details. I like to do shots with details, but I enjoy, you know, landscape and getting the environment. I, you know, I include a handful of personal images from family, just conversation starters. So if I'm yep. talking to somebody, they're talking about their kids. I show that my kids make it in. But, you know, I love little things that work in small spaces. Because a lot of times, I'm delivering to the web. But I want people to be able to see. And I use these as a conversation start. But at the same time, while an abstract image like this may be meaningless, it's a technique I enjoy. And it's something that, you know, it's interesting to see how does that connect. I include an image like this when I show something to a client because this is shows me somebody who's really into uh, opening ideas or abstract or being more creative. I try unusual composition, something classic like Lincoln Memorial rather than the classic head-on shot, to show here's something that's so overshot, how do we find something interesting in such that something that's been photographed hundreds, thousands of times, yeah. millions of times, and you know, I think that these little exercises of forcing yourself to narrow it down, so I view these business cards as an alternative portfolio. I still don't I still don't have a good handle on my own website portfolio of what images I'm showing, because for right now, I don't need to market my photography. My photography is sold by my business. It's sure. usually time lapse work. You know, people see our work, they get it. I don't try to market the rest of my photography. Tony, I imagine you have a, a style of photography that you sell, but you probably should enjoy shooting other things. How do you decide where you draw that line? What's what interesting is that, is that yeah, what's interesting is that I'm known as a lighting guy, and I, you know, my books, my videos, my seminars, everything that I do is all about light. And, and traditionally working with people. It's, it's people lighting controls. But all of my business cards, it's funny you brought that, <laughs> you brought that up because my business cards are all, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, a cathedral in Mexico City or a rock in Yosemite or this is, this is strawberry, whoops, strawberry Fields in, in Liverpool. Nice. Uh, where John Lennon grew up. You, you in, are a Beatle fan. <laughs> Mono, Mono Lake at sunrise. I mean, these are the things that... Um, these are the things that turn me on when, I, and when I'm shooting for no one but me. I want street photography and, and, and pictures that say something. Uh, so I, I completely understand what you're talking about. And I do think that, you know, I talked about in my workshops recently, I created a new slideshow where I talk about the duality of our craft, where we've got light quality and light quantity. Then we've got soft and hard. Then we've got, you know, all these different pairs of things. And I finish it off by public wants and personal desires. What does your clientele want you for, and what is it that you want to say? 
the closer you can blur that line, the happier you're going to be with your work. There's, there's a guy in, in Florida that I remember from years ago, um, uh, Kurt Littlecott. And Kurt, Kurt's a knucklehead guy in Orlando that would rather be shooting a wedding than anything, 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 anywhere in the world. And Kurt used to shoot so many weddings, but if he had a Saturday where he wasn't busy and he wasn't booked, he would call all the photographers around Orlando and ask if anybody needed a second shooter for the day. He just wanted to go shoot. That's a guy that thrived on being in and around weddings, and he would climb fences and climb trees to get the right shots. And the work was astonishing because he worked so hard at making it that way. You know, and and I think that's part of this. Uh, Rich is, you know, new photographers in particular, or young photographers in particular. This does not come by accident. You are not blessed with an amazing eye for everything that you do. Some of this you just absolutely have to work for. And Michael Jordan used to talk about that, about the hundred thousand free throws a week he would shoot, so that during a game when he was stressed and he was tired and worn out and everything was on the line, he knew how to make a three a free throw. You know. Yeah, it, it's being consistent so that you can shoot. I I recently spoke with Joe McNally, and uh, we we interviewed him for the podcast. He talked about how not every day is a great day. You know that sometimes you go out and you're feeling drained, and you you know you have to reach deep in. And some days are better than others. But he's so feels so comfortable with his equipment and understanding yeah. of the objectives that even on his worst day he still feels like he delivers what the client wants. Some days are better than others, but that you, know, that you have that strength to reach in. Now, yeah. let's, move, let's move into the quality side of um, making sure that clients appreciate their work. Do you have something that you want to throw yeah. yeah, no, no, Rich. Before we jump off of that, I want to hit yeah. on one idea that's going to help photographers when you're trying to show that diversity and you want to share it, but it doesn't necessarily fit with your target audience on your website. This is where a blog can become so important. I absolutely believe that today if you're in business where 20 years ago Dean said you needed a Yellow Pages ad and then 10 years ago everybody needed a website. Today I absolutely believe you need a website and a blog. And the difference is that your website is about what you sell. Your blog is about your heart. And I think you, with, your, with good blog posts it gives it gives a photographer a chance to be able to show that other side which can lead to other galleries and other images without without plugging up the uh, the main floor of your retail store which is and, and, which is essentially your website today yeah yeah okay and I, I, I don't want I don't want to step on that that's pretty good stuff okay well you were so, going to step on it well I was just going to make a comment you know um, <laughs> I, I know Joe pretty well, Joe uh, McNally pretty well, and, and, and he and I have spoken on platforms, you know, at the same time, and we've done a lot of things, and I've seen him a lot of times over the years, and we're pretty good buds. And he and I were on a panel discussion in Santa Fe one summer, and a member from the audience said, what is your biggest fear? And I was all ready with a real funny comeback, and McNally squashed me and said, let me take this one. And he said, I am terrified that I don't have any more good pictures left in me. And I thought, damn it, what, what a comment that he's, his, his biggest fear is that he doesn't have any good pictures left. Well, we all know Joe. Joe's going to always have good pictures in him. Uh, but, it, but it's an interesting concept. You know, clients hire us for different things. And, and basically, all of us in our, in our own sphere of our, our area of discipline, we are all paid to perform on demand. And we got to perform, and if and, and it's not like we're low paid. We're we're paid paid pretty well for the work that we do, but we've got to perform, and we can't miss. So it's not like well we'll get close, and and hopefully we can get the shot done. No, no, no. We were paid to get the shot done. We better get the shot done. You know. Well, I think this actually sets up a good conversation of part of quality. And uh, Skip, you brought up a thing about athletics and Michael Jordan and his practice. I uh, I wrestled in college. I did Division One athletics for a bit, and uh, before I blew me out the first time, and I would feel this tremendous pressure before going out on the mat. You know, this is a huge platform. I went to a school that had, as high school, that had several state championships, and I would always have a hard time sort of focusing. And our coach uh, at high school he was actually a former Olympic coach. He would just pull our head into the game. He would wake up, grab chest hair 
and just rip it out and say odd or even to like pull you into the moment of like just the sharp, intense pain of like, hey, you need to be here now, get in your head. And then if you got wrong, he'd pull it. And he basically was, he wasn't counting. He was just kept pulling until he realized that you had enough things to pull you into that moment and that you were intently focused through what would happen. And I, I have the same thing. You know, we all have families. We have other challenges. There's the financial challenges of running a business. There are so many things that can get into your head. But when I step on set or I step on location and there's the clients there, there's the people from the ad agency or the PR firm, and I need to work with them, I have to get immediate results. And they have to feel like I'm there 100% for them and that everything I'm doing is for that image. So I think part of quality especially in today's age of constant connection, is eliminating distractions. For example, I turn my phone off when I'm on shoots. I Absolutely. disconnect from the internet. I unplug. And I've got crew members who have their phone on silent or their phone vibrates. And I'm like, you're here on a set. You can't even take that call, so why is your phone even on? Unplug. Right. And same thing when I'm post-processing. I'll turn off email. I'll shut down chat. My email, even if it's on, doesn't download until I click download. There are so many constant distractions. I think people are incapable of focusing on the end quality unless they learn to take filters. And for me, that's some hard filtering with physical actions uh, just to really keep me in the moment. You guys have anything to add on that? that part? Yeah, I think, and I think going along with that, Rich, is if you have, <clears throat> pardon me, if you have confidence in your abilities, and you know, and you know, clear, you know clearly, clearly what you a variation from whatever the whatever the shoot might have called for. Your clients will go along with you because you've built trust. They trust you to get the end job done and to get the best job for them. And you, they know you and trust that you are, you know, you've built this relationship. They trust that you have their best interests in, at heart. They'll they'll go along with you just about anything you want to try to do. You might stop a shoot and say, you know what, this isn't working. I, I'm sorry to do this to you, but you, th this this bright red uh, striped shirt does not work with her earth toned dress. You you got to change. You got We got to get you in some different clothes. Whatever whatever the case may be, you got to shut it down and think like a photographer and fix this. You know, and they'll buy into it and go, yeah, you're right. Okay. Yeah. You know this. You know this, this all goes back this all to goes back to comfortable. Comfortable. Uh, why am I getting a reverb? Why am I getting a reverb? Does somebody have a somebody have a need to reverb? Uh, no, uh, I'm, no, I'm, I just got a headphone. Got anyway, a headphone. anyway, uh, the uh, the, challenge the challenge is having is your head in the game, game, as you said, as Rich. You said, Rich. And a big and part of it big becomes, part becomes making sure making that sure you are that comfortable. Are comfortable. Like, Tony, I got to laugh. Tony, Tony was laugh. there for the Tony first time I ever had to step up to a microphone and introduce Dean Collins in front of. 2,000 people at the Beacons Theater in New York. I had never done it before. Hadn't been near a microphone since, you know, high school doing the pledge maybe at a, at, 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 a, at a school conference or something. And I got up and I stuttered and I fell apart. And it was like, hello. And I listened to my voice go out into the microphone. Um, well, after you've done it enough, and this comes back to practice, you know, everybody's always a little nervous before they do the presentation, but just as a photographer, when I'm when I'm teaching a workshop, um, you know when you're on your game. You know when you've got the shot. You know when everything is clicking, and it all comes back out of a combination of confidence and believing in yourself and having done it so many times that you can do it with your eyes closed. So it does come back to it's it's all that stuff about in the beginning that we talked about with your skill set and being comfortable so that you know that you're going to be on your game and those distractions even if a little one jumps in now and then it doesn't pull you out of the moment so to that end one of the things I think that's a bit tough is tough. sometimes I sometimes think you got your volume, maybe. Your volume maybe. Pull it down a little bit yeah we're getting a little echo yeah there you go I'm going to turn it <clears throat> and call back in one second um, so one of the things that, that's a bit tough is that people uh, get their confidence shaken by their clients. You know, they're not sure how to handle this. They're they're trying to juggle. Clients give them criticism, or somebody gives them criticism. How do you figure that out, Tony? How do you learn to shake it off and back to believing that what you're doing is right? 
<clears throat> pardon me. I think I think the first thing is you have to um, you really have to spend time with the client or your model or the subject or whatever you're photographing to make clear that you know what the what the goals are. Uh, as long as you know what the goal is, what the stated goal is, uh, it's all about, isn't it always about meeting or exceeding expectations? The main thing is you can't fall short of expectations. Um, but it, but if I often, put my... often, Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say that often in, in commercial photography, uh, an art director will say things like, well, I don't know, this just doesn't hit me. Well, if you can, if you can articulate what you really, really are trying to say, either give me a comp or trust me to try to do something, then I can probably hit it. But when you're kind of nebulous and you have something in your head that you can't tell me what you want, I'm probably not going to hit it first time out. And we are going to have to work pretty closely together to try to make something happen. Um, but, you know, you know, Chip Simons used to always say, Chip, who was in New York for years, in Santa Fe, now he's back in New York, I think. Chip used to always say he gets 250 jobs a year for magazine editorial, and they're storytelling images. And the reason is because he has nonstop ideas in his head. You know, they, People Magazine would call and say, we've got a story, we've got an idea for a story on the explosion of people barbecuing in their backyards, uh, and we need a picture, and we need it in about three hours. Can you shoot something and get it to us? And Chip will go, yep, i got four ideas. Here they are. Bam, 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 and bam. Whereas another photographer might go, well, tell me what you have in mind. Tell me what kind of, what kind of picture you're seeing. He didn't wait for what they had in mind. He would say, I've got these four ideas, which one do you like? And I'll go get the, I'll round up the neighbors and their kids and go to the store and get about 30 chickens and throw them on the grill right now. <laughs> you know? So you gotta, you've got to have photographic control over situations often like that. I want to throw out another story out there. Another story there. Oh, Tony and I share and a mutual share friend, a friend uh, uh, Nick Vitas. Uh, and Nick, when he does a presentation, he will go through. Now, Nick is, I think Nick is one of the most creative commercial shooters in the country. And Nick would go through and he'll show you the first image saying, this is what the art director told me they wanted. This is what I wound up doing and, and how I took from their idea into what they really needed and how it all worked out. And he'll take you through the steps. And what I love about, about these Google Plus Hangouts, I mean, Tony and I have thrown out um, probably a half dozen names here today, and Rich, you had a couple in there too. These are all people that that listeners, if you don't know who they are, go jump on Google and look up uh, Chip Simons, look up Nick Vidros. Um, everybody knows McNally, but you may not know some of McNally's early work and some of the things that Joe is doing now. And there's so many incredible artists in this industry, and the common denominator, or one of them, besides passion and integrity, the common denominator with all of them is quality. Quality in their work, quality in the way they live their lives, quality in the way they communicate. Well, to that end, and we're sort of towards the end, I want to wrap up with a couple of parting pieces of advice, uh, and then we'll give you guys some extra resources to check. One of the things I know people struggle with is we've seen this huge growth in photo communities, online communities, whether it be Facebook groups, you know, Skip, you have some. You have a great Facebook group. We've got a Facebook group, a Google Plus group, and now a 500 pixels group for our readers over at PhotoFocus.com. And people will post work, and the quality of criticism is very low. Uh, everyone's either way too nice or they're way too harsh. And I see a lot of people get completely stymied by criticism. They don't know how to take criticism and use it to improve themselves. Rather, they get hung up on trying to make everybody happy. Tony, as you you know became known for your work, and and you know in many ways, um, this is a generational thing. Photographers that are coming out now don't know who to listen to and how to judge their quality. Tony, any advice you can offer on you know who to pay attention to and what to pay attention to? It's a, it's a it's a real challenge because. Um, you, you said it, Rich, exactly. Some people are just nice. And they want to be nice, and they want to be liked, and they don't want to say anything bad. I remember watching Don Blair, my, my favorite old Big Daddy Don, uh, tell a young photographer in Florida one afternoon where this guy said, what do you think of this work? And this picture was bad. It, it was really bad. I mean, there was, it was, there was nothing about it that was very good. <laughs> and Don said, well, I'm going to be honest with you, old buddy. The choice of that dress on this model was perfect. <laughs> but he said, 
I think we have some things that we can improve on on the posing and the lighting and the expressions. <laughs> so you, you, picked a, you picked a good subject, and that's not it. You got a great subject, and the dress is terrific, but the pose is pretty pretty rough, and the lighting is not good, and the expression she looks a little bored. So, you know, he started off with something nice, and then he built on that. But he always always gives them something nice to say before he says, but here are some areas that we've got to fix. And I think that, you know, I've judged a lot, as, as Skip knows, I was jury chair out at WPPI for a lot of years. And, and you, you know, you do have to say, you've got to be honest, you can't let an average picture go through with a high score. You, you have to shut it down and say, I know, I know how much effort you put into this, but you just missed. And you have to be real honest with people like that. And, uh, and it's, not, it's not always easy. But uh, I think all of us that have been doing this a while, we get asked for our comments and our input a lot. And we've got to just be fair and honest and say, this is pretty average for the average photographer. If you're wanting to move it to another level, you're going to have to step it up. And that means you've got to improve the quality of this, 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 and this. And, and it can always be done. There's always room for improvement. But where did the question go? hit? Oh, I did it to you again. Go ahead. Your question hit on my number one pet peeve when it comes to the Facebook forums because it's really tough. I'm a co-administrator of the of of one of the wedding groups. There are 21,000 photographers in that group, and there are two things that happen in critique. One is people are too soft, and they'll say, "Gee, that's a really nice image," and you know they're they're saying all the things that every guy's mother um, would say. Um, and then the second side is when you think they're too harsh, one of the things that people forget about is that the printed word, writing a critique, is the toughest way to communicate. There's no inflection of your voice, there's no eye contact, right. and people, I have seen print critiques turn into outright political battles and people screaming that, you know, you've got an, a real, a religious, uh, excuse me, a religious affiliation. Um, you're a racist. I mean, there's so many different things that come out of just the way somebody interprets what somebody writes. So the two sides of it are, one, if you're going to put a print up, then be willing to accept the good news and the bad news and just roll with it. Listen to it. Take whatever is said in a way that can help you improve your work. Throw out what you're not happy with. And on the other side is we need to get everybody with a little bit of a thicker skin. I mean, we get every day I get two people reported because they didn't say something in a certain way. And then I'll go back, and a lot of times I can't find what they said wrong. So it's, it's a tough one on the critique. And it's very different. If you go to a convention and you've got an opportunity to do live portfolio review, usually when you're face-to-face, -face, I don't think anybody has ever had a situation like you see on so many of the different online forums where if you're face-to-face -face with somebody and they're giving you good advice, it is like the scenario that... Uh, Tony just shared with our buddy Big Daddy Blair. So Tony, anything you want to add to that? One second, Tony. I'm trying to get your mic unmuted. <laughs> Good. There we go. Go ahead, Tony. Start uh, I would thank you. I, I would I would add that um, when you're asking for feedback, and if you really are looking for true feedback, don't show any images to any of us that you have an emotional attachment to. Don't show us pictures of your children. <laughs> don't show us pictures of your granddad. Because you've got such an emotional attachment to the image, it's hard for you to understand any objective comments that we might make uh, or, or even subjective comments that we might make because you're so tied to that image. So it's, not, it's like I tell everybody, don't enter print competition with anything you have an emotional attachment to because no matter what happens, you can't let go of that attachment. If it scores poorly, I can't believe they just did not like, and then you're going to you know, go all over the judges. Well, you shouldn't have entered your kid's skateboarding, you know? <laughs> so that makes, that makes absolute sense. So let's wrap up right now and uh, tell folks where they can get in touch to learn more. I'm with the website photofocus.com, and, uh, of course, this Hangout comes out once a month. You can check out some of the back archives there, or if you are looking at this video on YouTube, you can click through and see other past Hangouts we've had. Uh, I really appreciate you guys tuning in, and, of course, there's daily website content there at PhotoFocus. Skip, why don't you go next and tell folks some of the resources that you have available at skipcohenuniversity.com? Yeah. 
You'll find everything I'm working on at skipcohenuniversity.com. You'll also find me on Twitter at Skip Cohen. You'll also find me on Facebook at Skip Cohen. And I'm on it, whoa, all the time. <laughs> and Tony, where, where can folks go find out more of your stuff? Well, my website is corbellproductions.com. Um, I've started a new blog for Bowen's Lighting. I'm their new lighting evangelist. I'm doing tons of workshops and videos and blogs and live webinars for uh, for them, and it's all at teambowens.com. Uh, and then I've got a lot of workshops and seminars all over the world coming up, and and uh, you can you can find all about it. Uh, got a new series that I'm working on right now that I'm not sure that I'm supposed to be talking about it yet, <laughs> but it will be titled The Joy of Lighting, and it'll be two-day series of workshops that travel around the country as opposed to a two-hour evening thing. This is a two-day event that will go to several places. So uh, more about that in the next 30 days will be out. But, Tony, uh, where, very, very where, Tony, where can people Tony. find your schedule? Where's where's the easiest spot to find it? Because you are you you probably teach more than just about anybody we've had on as a guest. You're gone. Where'd you it's go? It's funny. Over the Where years, I've I've sort of kept I've sort of kept a loose track. And this past year, I passed 600 seminars or workshops. Wow. So I, I do a lot. <laughs> and are those on your website at Corbell Productions, or where do people find they, them? The, the new schedule is going up on the website on Friday. So awesome. we're finalizing a couple of last-minute dates now, but that will all go live on Friday this week. So right. it will all be cool. there for the next 12 months. Well, I'd like to thank our guest, Tony Corbell, for joining us today. Always great to have fresh opinions on the website. And, Skip, thank you as well for uh, tuning in this week. Anything else you want to say of closing advice, Skip? No, just reminding everybody that if you've got a chance to go see Tony in a workshop, just do it. Awesome. Well, also, any good stories, man, Skip. I appreciate you guys. And any stories and he any tells stories about me are lies. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you guys so much for joining this week's Hangout for Mind Your Own Business. Remember, if you click through to the YouTube channel, you can find some of our past month's recording. And I really appreciate you guys watching live. Remember, video will be available on YouTube just minutes after this ends. So if there's somebody you think who would benefit from this, just send them the YouTube link or post it to their Facebook or Google Plus wall and let them take a look. And thanks so much for joining us, everyone.